so hi everybody welcome to uh personally i don't think it's september i'm still in march um, yeah. and it feels like it sometimes too i was telling somebody just a minute ago that it's like 47 the other day and when i got up at six and it's we're definitely seeing that in the garden we were having a little conversation about tomatoes um and Sheila was saying that her tomatoes are particularly delicious this year because she thinks probably because of the seawater uh, treatment that she gave them. And I don't know if all any of you were here when we talked about tomatoes earlier, but I always give tomatoes about um, a quart per plant of fresh seawater early in their process when they're still blooming or just starting to set fruit. And it actually will give them a much bolder, stronger flavor than they would have otherwise. And it, this research came out of Cornell. You know, a lot of um, New Jersey was a huge tomato raising state and they started discovering that their tomatoes were losing flavor and did a whole lot of studies and discovered that the fields were getting low in sodium. So you can't just dump salt on a field, but they made these seaweed extracts you can buy. But here we are on an island, so we can just go dip a gallon jug in there and pour some on every plant. It's a little late to do it now, but it might be worth trying if you haven't tried it because my plants are still setting fruit. They think it's like early July. So I think it's worth doing now if you haven't done it already. So next time you water, um, just water like you would and wait about an hour and then put in about a quart of seawater per plant. Try not to have any starfish or anything in there. You don't want fauna, just the water. <laughs> But it will um, it will definitely kick up the flavor because it's not just the salt, but the minerals as well. Kind of fun. Sheila said she's not even getting hers in the door. All her tomatoes get eaten on the deck. But some of us are starting to see enough tomatoes that you got to think of something to do with them. Anybody got a glut of tomatoes on their hands? No. I've got enough that I'm starting to make some sauces and things. But... Um, yeah, it's in fact, my tomatoes came from the senior center. I don't know if you can see this bowl of beauty, but those were plants that we got at the senior center uh, tomato giveaway back in, wasn't that in March? March or April, something like that. Um, and those plants have done really, really well. So I also have a glut of plums. And I don't know, does anyone here have a plum tree? The plums are having an incredible bonanza year and I've made plum jam and plum pie and <laughs> plum preserves and I've taken plums to everybody in the neighborhood. So it's been kind of a fun uh, bonanza year for that. I also been thinking about what's still going on in the garden. We, um, our community has a, a little beehive and one of the fun things to see is how many different kinds of bees you can spot in your garden on a given day. And I've been up to 15 different species, lots of lots of native bees, as well as honey bees. Um, the mason bees and the bumblebees are kind of retired. They're pretty much back to dormancy, but there's still quite a lot of different kinds of native bees out there. And it's really fun to go out and just listen to the hum. It's like, that's my meditation. When I get stressed out, I go look at the garden and watch the bees and just start, like, isn't there a humming meditation? There must be. Mm -hmm. And I think I told you before that middle C is the magical buzz note for pollination of all kinds of plants, including tomatoes. So if your tomatoes are flowering but not setting fruit, you can go out there, find middle C on your phone. You, everybody can, you can just look it up and it will buzz it. And then you just keep humming that note Mm, and you'll pollinate your own tomatoes. It's kind of fun. You can play bee at being a bee. So who's got some questions? Rita. I have a million um, little, the little Oregold tomatoes and they're there's tons of green ones and, and some of them starting to ripen up, but I have got so many green ones. So I know I'm going to leave them on there for a while, but when it gets, I mean, if it starts to rain or it gets real bad, can I bring, how can I get those to ripen up? Or you can, yeah, tomatoes that get, that you pick will keep ripening in the house. 
Um, and you can put them in a paper bag with a ripe banana. That is, you know, ethylene gas is sort of the famous trigger for ripening. But you can also just put them on a rimmed baking sheet with a little olive oil and bake them at 225, roast them, and they will make the most incredible caramelized tomatoes that you can add to sauces. You can freeze them. That's what I always do at the end when I'm tired of the whole business. I just take whatever's left over and roast them and then freeze that mixture. It's really delicious. Um, <laughs> the tomatoes are green. Yeah, the, when they're green and you bring them in, you might want to put them in an egg carton or something like that one by one because if they touch each other and they they tend to get moldy. Okay. So you want good air circulation around them. I sometimes put them on a little um, little cooling racks with fine mesh. Right. I've got some of those to make sure they get plenty of air and then they'll dry out beautifully. Or if you have a dehydrator, like a fruit dehydrator, you can draw you can do your own not sun-dried tomatoes. Okay. And what, are, what, what are the specifics you just said about uh, roasting them? The green tomatoes? I put I, either if they're bigger than little, I cut them in half and I just put some olive oil or I use avocado oil on the baking sheet because it's a really high, um, doesn't scorch at all. And then so you split them or just put the cherry tomatoes whole uh, in, with a little oil and then put them at either 225 for a long time or 400 for a short time, depending on how easily you get bored or how much time you have. Um, if you put them on high, they'll go fast, but you gotta watch them. If you put them on low and slow, 225, you can just kind of let them go for a couple hours. Um, they will make a mess. So you want a rimmed baking sheet and probably not one that you're super fond of. I have an old beater baking sheet that I use for that kind of stuff. Um, it's already funky looking, so it's good to, um, it's a good one for sacrifice. And, th and then you then you freeze them afterwards? Yeah, you can just pour them into little containers or zip bags or something and, and freeze them. And in the freezer, they'll last six months or more. In fact, I just dug some out the other day that I discovered when I was exploring the back of my freezer. And they are, let's be clear, probably closer to a year old, but they were great in a sauce. So not recommended, but doable. So you just make them up into a sauce then? No, I just freeze them as they are, and then you can add them to soup or stew or chili or anything you like, pasta yeah. sauce. Some people have asked earlier about um, cracking skins on tomatoes or tough skins on tomatoes. And those things happen a lot when there's irregularity in watering, which is not your fault. It's just part of what happens. We have these cool mornings and cold nights, and then it gets pretty warm pretty fast in the later afternoon. And sometimes the tomatoes can't quite keep up with it, so their skin will split. Or if their skins are kind of tough, it's usually that they weren't getting quite enough water. Probably back goes back to that hot, that single hot day <laughs> we had um, when a lot of our plants got pretty stressed out. It's amazing how much can happen to a plant in just a day, right? This is a good time if your tomatoes are, are you still got a lot of green ones, you could start trimming the tops and not encouraging any more blooming because um, it will be putting a lot of energy into making new fruit. So if you cut the flowering bits off, you've had enough set fruit set already, then the plant will focus on that. And if you need to trim some of the foliage so those little forming fruits get more light, you don't want to take it all off because that's what feeds the plant essentially. But, um, but you can take extra foliage off, especially on the sun side. Now, if it happens to get super hot again, then you can get a little sun scald, but it doesn't hurt the tomato and it doesn't taste bad. It just, it's almost like a little bit of a, a sunburn on the shoulders of the fruit. Um, but it's not super likely. It doesn't look like we're gonna have any big Indian summer scorchers in our future. Sheila asked me if I'm giving plums away. Sadly, I'm not giving plums away, but my neighbor had a tree that was loaded up. Um, but I'm, I can probably find you a bag full if I, in, later in the week, we'll see how it goes. If I have a big ladder, I might be able to find some in my backyard. Oh, Reed, you could, because you've got that little tree. I have a ladder. All right. <laughs> <laughs> We're on. <laughs> yeah, I gave your wife some plum jam this morning from those plums. I like to make jam with ripe fruit and just instead of using the usual recipe, 
I just use ripe fruit and some unri less ripe fruit, cut it in half or chop it up and slow cook it. I used for the jam, plum jam, I did eight cups of fruit chopped up and two cups of sugar. I let it sit for a couple hours in the pan and then put it on really low, slow covered and it sort of melts. And then you got to bring it up to a boil and, and heat it up and get it going. And that's when you have to start stirring. But the gel point for anything, any kind of fruit is 220, which means you have to get it over a boil. And the whole point is you're driving off the excess water and the fruit. So you can actually make really good jam without pectin or without a whole ton of sugar. You just have to be patient and have a long handled spoon because it spits like crazy. <laughs> Rita, are you asking a question or is that you're showing off your cast? It's a very handsome cast. <laughs> Well, I was going to show you some of the flowers out of the garden too. Here, is, can you see this? I'm dripping on my computer. That's probably not smart. Um, this is a uh, catmint, and it is the longest blooming plant in my garden and one of the, my favorite things of all the bees and pollinators. Um, when you, if you trim it back, it will bloom three or four times, or just keep producing more and more bloom stalks, and so. I wait until the first long stems are sort of spent and I cut those back and you'll see all this new growth at the center and then it just keeps coming and coming and mine are in fresh bloom again just in time to keep the late bees happy. It's a pretty great plant and lots of oreganos. Um, this one's called Amethyst Falls and it's got a very pretty flower shape and the bees again I love that and this is a Greek mountain oregano and an Italian oregano, neat and tidy. Those also dry really, really well. And I like to use them on uh, arrangements and stuff because they look the same for months and nobody can tell that you haven't actually been taking care of them. They just have this immortal quality. It's very nice. Um, verbena, here's a purple verbena that's been blooming for four, five months, still going strong. Some of those annuals actually will overwinter here, um, especially if they're in a slightly protected spot. So if they still look pretty good, don't don't pull them out and throw them away, but just give them a little compost mulch or put some leaves over them and see if they don't make it through. Lots of them will. And you know, all those plants are kind of spendy, so it's worth uh, making see if you, seeing if you can coax something to have a longer season. Um, when we start dipping further down, the nights right now are still in the high 40s, low 50s. When you start getting down into the 30s, that's when you want to start thinking about putting away things like geraniums if you have them out on your deck. Um, but hardening them off by leaving them out is good until that that time. And then just some people put them under the eaves or just out of the sun in a dry place and they'll winter over and go on for years and years and years, which is kind of great too. Who's got a question for me? Do you mind if I ask? No, nope. not type. Okay. Please. So I am a very, very novice gardener. I always kid it, if I if I can't I kill things. I don't keep them alive. But I rent, moved into an apartment that thankfully had a little plot, and the old tenant really loved to garden. So I'm trying to keep this thing alive. So my question is: beautiful hydrangea bush mm -hmm. did wonderful this year. Um, when I go to cut it back, somebody said, well, just cut it back very strong. What are they talking about? I mean, all the way back down? What do, I don't, you know, you need to use terms that I sort of, so when I cut it back, what am I supposed to do? Oh, good. That's a great question, Christina. And the thing is, hydrangeas are hard to kill. So the worst that would happen if you cut it too hard is you wouldn't get any bloom for a year. But when you don't have very many plants, that's a problem, right? So mostly with the hydrangea, you can wait and let them dry up, go a lot, lot longer. Um, sometimes they're really beautiful as they dry. Some of them go into really pretty shades, of sort of pinks and purples and uh, coppery greens. So I wouldn't cut them back now. Um, and just uh, about, I don't know, any time over the late fall or winter, you can start cutting them back and look below the bloom you'll, to the next set of leaves that are big because you'll get the bloom head and a couple of small leaves. And if you look further down the stem, you can usually see where the new growth has been. 
the new growth will be greener and more flexible. The old growth will be kind of gnarly and brown or gray. If it's really funky, I often take all the, the oldest branches that lie on the ground. I'll cut those all the way off at the base because those are the ones that rot and get moldy and mildewy. Um, and you want to open the plant up a little bit. So if you have branches that cross or are too close together, tangled, take out the weakest or the anything that crosses, take out the least attractive one or the one that's going in a direction you don't want it to. And so pruning is a lot of paying attention. Um, and you're never going to get perfect. It's like if we pulled out every gray hair, we'd all be bald, right? At some point, you just have to say, this is fine, but you kind of want to do it fairly even. Um, it, it, hydrangeas usually bloom on the younger growth. So if you cut it wet back super hard, you'll have to wait a year to, for, to produce some of that softer, greener growth. Then it can bloom on that. But if you don't take it back super hard, um, you'll get a lot of bloom next year. Um, and really a lot of it is simply looking at the plant and making, if it looks tangly like a big mess, sometimes you can take out a whole big old branch and let these younger ones have more space and they'll do better. Does that make sense? And really remember, you're not going to really hurt it. Um, but it would love some compost, like every fall or late winter, put a bag of nice compost around the base. Um, that's pretty much it. They're real easy going, which is nice. <laughs> you're welcome. Hey, Anne. Yes. Um, Tom and Country were selling those uh, basil plants. Did you see those? Yeah, they're beautiful. I bought one and I'm, I'm wondering how do I cut it? I've used it several times, but I'm not sure I'm cutting it in the right spot to help it keep producing. Well, the thing about, yeah, those are annuals around here. Mm -hmm. so, but what you want to do is you'll cut the younger growth off, but you'll leave it two or three sets of leaves at the base. Okay. And you can see sometimes they start shading themselves out a little bit. So if you cut those back, you cut off the flowers, you can use those in pesto or, or whatever too. Um, it, you're basically, you're either pinching the tops, which is the tender young things, or if you're going to take more of it, cut it back so that you have at least two sets of good leaves under it. And then when next time you water it, you might want to feed it a little bit too to give it some encouragement. Did you pot them up into a bigger pot? No, I just left it in the same pot. Yeah, so they don't have any resources. So you have to be the resource director. Oh, okay. <laughs> giving it a little food every couple weeks uh, will okay. keep it productive. And, you know, you can keep those things going. Usually I get them going to till Thanksgiving or Christmas, and then they get aphids or whitefly or something and they all die. But um, yeah, okay. it, you can keep them going. It, especially, do you have a warm, sunny windowsill? When it starts to get cold, put them in that windowsill and see. Oh, okay. They yeah. will go yeah. on and on. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Sure. And, you know, you can make pesto out of other things too, like oregano or turbo, uh, yeah, turbo actually, or um, parsley or time there's lots of things that are good in sauces like that so this is yeah. a good time to harvest herbs if you want to dry them or mm -hmm. make herb salts grind them like one cup of herbs of any kind you like and one cup of salt and grind them up and put them in that 225 degree oven with the <laughs> tomatoes <laughs> and they'll make a crust and then you break that up and buzz it again in the cuisinart or whatever and that'll last for two years three years um, but yeah, that's what I do with herbs at this time of year. Perfect. You can Italian blend. You can make a French blend with lavender and oregano or margarine and thyme. It's fun. Yeah. Sounds wonderful. Yeah. Instead of buying them at the store, just make our own blends. You know, when they're 7 to $12 a little bottle. They are. You can make it for the price of the salt. Mm-hmm. thinking that's yeah. a pretty good deal. Absolutely. <coughs> Great. Thank you. Barbara, did you have a question? Maybe not. I did have a couple of questions about madrona trees this week from people. I don't know if any of you have madronas. Yes, I'm seeing uh, a lot of them are kind of flagging. This is the thing about madronas is they're evergreen, but like they're broadleaf evergreens, like a camellia kind of. And they're basically a big shrub that looks like a tree. Well, they are, trees, but they grow more like a shrub. And all their leaves are evergreen, but they last yeah. five years. So August, September, that's when you start to see a lot of the leaves turning yellow and dropping off perfectly. Normal. It does not mean they want water. One of the things they hate is summer water. 
and giving them water because you think they're having a struggle is a good way to usher them out because then they become much more susceptible to viruses and diseases. So if you have a madrona that's struggling, do not water it. Um, and it may not be struggling at all. One thing when people are transplanting them, you've got to remember they actually prefer full sun and they need good drainage. They don't like clay. They like sandy soils. And if you only have clay, put them at the top of a slope and at least they'll get good drainage that way. But there's certainly a beautiful, beautiful tree that provides shelter and food for a lot of native critters, which is kind of great. Um, I've got a question about dahlias. Sure. Um, I have sort of a, a, a mixed success with dahlias, but I refuse to dig them out in the, in the fall. There's just too much going on to mess with all those. Um, and and uh, some of them come back just lush and beautiful. Others come back with just the green part and no flowers, a small green part. Is What's the reason for that? I mean, it seems to me if they're alive, they're alive, but... Well, it's a little more complicated than that because dahlias are, um, the, what we buy are, are complicated crosses between different species. And some of them are more tender and some of them are hardier. And around here, I, you can get away with just leaving them in the ground. And there's quite a few that will be hardy for many years. If they're not making it very well, there's two reasons. It could be partly because it's a semi-tender cross and it had a little too much cold. And you could try putting a lot more dried leaves and things over them in the fall. But the other reason could be slugs, because slugs love dahlia new growth and they'll yeah. keep the buds off. Um, and so you might put a little teeny bit of sluggo just right around the base of your plants in the spring. Uh, it's probably a little late for it to do you much good now. Um, well, I have been doing that, but still not much, you know. You have been baiting and they, it hasn't helped? Right. Huh. Yeah, and then I say you probably have some semi-tender, semi-hardy uh, you might try lifting them and putting them in a big container and they because plants in containers ha have warmer soil and warmer roots and they warm up a lot faster in the spring so that can be a way to kind of coax them through a plant that might not do so well in the ground our clay okay. gets really heavy and cold so do dahlias um if they're healthy uh, get more lush every year or how does that work? Yeah, they keep on growing and getting bigger and bigger. And one of the reasons people dig them up is not just because they want to overwinter them in their garage, but because they get big, they get really big and have yeah. a lot of offsets and you can divide them up and have a lot more plants. If yeah. you do that, when you dig them up, you want to make sure that every piece of the root <coughs> of the storage tuber has an eye, which is a shoot. Come in. So it's really easy to tell if you do it in the fall because they'll have a stem and some leaves coming off. And you can yeah. trim that off, leaving maybe an inch or two of stem and dry those out of the direct light. I put them in mesh bags like onions or potatoes come in and label them because you won't remember in the spring which one was yellow or which one was pink. <laughs> but that's right. a really good way to have more um, if one yeah. that you really like and you want to multiply it. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Sure. I do suggest having a dedicated knife in your garden tool kit because I've gotten in trouble many times for taking my good knives out into the garden and whacking away at things. And then they're not quite the same sometimes after that. I have a question about camellias. You mentioned camellias. Can you train them? Yeah. <clears throat> Just like me. You mean I've you want it to a, sit or stand or what? Yeah, I want it, I want it to go over the top of a shed. Why? Because it's kind of trapped in between two sheds. You don't really, I mean, it's kind of goofy, but I'd like to let it kind of go up a side of a wall and out. Is that possible or does it just want to go up? Well, I'm just wondering why, because of a couple things. Like, first of all, putting plants on a wooden structure is never the best plan because of mold and mildew and carpenter ants and so forth, right? not to mention rats and things. But yeah, they're they're quite trainable on a trellis. Or So one way you can do that is to mount some two by fours or four by fours even against the side of the structure and then put uh, like hog wire 
fasten that to that. And then you can train the camellias onto the hog wire. They're most trainable when they're fairly young. Those long whippy shoots are much more trainable than big established stems. Um, and some kinds are more than others. The, uh, the, they also grow to different heights. Like a lot of the Japanese and the Chinese winter blooming or fall blooming um, camellias are gonna be eight, eight to 10 feet maybe at most. But some of the other camellias that are much bigger than that and can get 15 feet or even 20 feet over a long, long time. So if you wanted to come up and sort of arch over, you could actually make a frame for that, like uh, you know, an angled frame of wood and then have the have your hog wire attached to that firmly. And then, yeah, you can you wire it in and you use that. At the nurseries, you can buy fat wire that's coated with rubber and you make a soft tie with that and kind of coil it around the branch so that you're coaxing it and it won't gouge and it won't like a lot of those ties will actually create a constriction in the branch that will later come back and bite you because it will harm the branch. Does that make sense? Yes. So those twisty ties that I've been saving are not the right thing for this job. They are not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> They're not the right thing for very many jobs, actually. Even string can be kind of, you'll, you often find like an older branch that's grown in and there's this string or a tie that's way deep inside it. And that is not good for the circulation of the plant. Years ago, we used to use pantyhose. We'd cut, cut on the leg, leg because they were soft and they would really stretch out and they really used to work good. But those were the old, old days. <laughs> Yes, there are no more pantyhose to be found. <laughs> no. So I have a I have another question. I don't know whether I mean this is kind of a bigger tree question. I have a black walnut in my backyard, and there is a big uh, hole in it. You know, it's like it's it was it was wounded or it, like somebody cut off a branch years ago, and it has a hole in the in the tree. Is that is it going to be? Is that is that dangerous? Well, it depends, of course. Um, if you see that the hole has a crack and is oozing and weeping, then yeah, you probably do have a problem. If it's healed over, like so they will, um, you may end up having somebody move in there and right. make more of a home. Um, but if the rest of the tree looks healthy and is still growing evenly, it's probably fine. It's probably healed over. One of the things when you have a big tree and an injury like that is you look at it, especially like in the spring when it starts to leaf out, notice if different quadrants of it leaf out at different times, or if say three quarters of it is leafing out normally and one quarter is really small um, and late. That usually indicates a vascular problem that means that something along the line there is not good. And a lot of times you'll see on those bigger older trees, what's called included bark where the branch and the trunk are separating like this but there's a lot of bark included in this part. So instead of just being straight off, there's kind of a join and that join is a weak spot always. And that's where you'll often see some dripping and ripping and those branches can get ripped off and leave a hole or a gash like you're describing. Um, and sometimes the tree will just heal it over, but sometimes it won't. Um, if that tree's pretty old, so I imagine it's come through quite a bit already, but keep your eye on it in terms of Dripping and oozing. Okay, so far it's been holding its moisture. It's a goo. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, watch those moisture zones, right? <laughs> One thing I'm just starting to do is empty out some of my beds and pots. And if you do grow things in containers and pots, and you're finished with the season, it's a really good idea to either find somebody who has a compost heap and share your soil with them and start all over again, or at least empty out the top. I actually empty out all of it onto a big tarp or something and break it all up because that soil has done its job and it needs to be replenished or refreshed. Um, and the same thing goes for our beds. A lot of times that we've been growing stuff all summer and they've been working hard and as we harvest, take it out, well, it's still hot enough that the top of the soil can get pretty dried out and and uh, some of the soil life will be driven down deeper into the soil. So as you harvest or clean up or empty things, 
put some compost on top. And if it's been crusted over by a lot of watering, many of our plants that get watered every day start getting really crusty. You can take that little garden rake that nobody ever really uses and just scritch the soil a little bit and open it up. And then the water will actually be absorbed a lot better. Um, and then you can also, if when you're emptying a bed, you're taking quite a bit of soil out with it sometimes, like with potatoes and things, then put a generous amount of compost on top and work it a little in to the top few inches so that you can kind of restore the plant life, the soil plant life, soil food web, web is full of little creatures that you can't even see, but that's what's keeping that soil working and functional. Uh, and this is a good time to start looking for deals on bagged compost. If you're on a patio and you can't really have three yards delivered, right? <laughs> I've had really good luck with the stuff at, weirdly enough, at Safeway, they have this bagged co organic compost from I think it's Carpentito Brothers or Carpentino Brothers or something like that. And it's really, really good stuff. I'm quite impressed. And I have a question. Um, so I have my tomatoes, of course, and I have them in a, a high pot. Um, and it's uh, and I put brand new compost, uh, brand new soil, potting soil in there this year. Um, and uh, did have done the uh, Miracle Grow. Actually, I just did it again today, um, every, you know, twice a month kind of thing like I'm supposed to. Now, will that soil be good enough for next year? Not really, because it's if you think about the volume of the plant it's supported, it's usually a pretty good sized plant, right? Your tomatoes. Yeah. Are, yeah. It's huge. So it's probably pretty full. Like there isn't like if you when you come to empty that pot, uh, it's going to be full of roots, which means it's already done its job. So okay. kind of consider the cost of the new soil as the part of the cost of growing your own food. <laughs> I know, but it's it's just, it's not a real savings because what happens after a while is the soil becomes degraded and it's just holding your plant upright. It's no longer able to support plant growth. And then you're completely dependent on miracle Grow or whatever you're going to feed it with. So I feel like it's a better deal to use a higher, a nicer quality potting soil, especially for something I'm going to eat, and and make sure that the plants get a good start. So that's the Carpertino that uh, up at Safeway, you said? Yeah, it's right to the right of the door, and it might be Carpenito or something. I can't exactly remember, but it, yeah, because all because all I need is one 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 bag of them for the uh, pot. Well. It's compost, so you, you don't plant into compost pure. So you oh. plant half compost and half potting soil, say. Okay. Um, but compost is not actually potting soil. So it's more right. like right. It's a soil, uh, soil improver. And it, to some extent, it's going to be plant food, but it's not actually soil. Does that make sense? So what I need to do is get uh, new uh, potting soil and uh, new and this Carpertino too. Yeah, but if you're not going to grow winter vegetables, you might as well wait until spring and then it will be fresher and it won't be sitting around on your deck all winter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the thing. People don't realize that a lot of potting soils are, are sitting around and they're not, um, they're actually losing some of their goodness. So you want to wait till whoever nursery you get it from has a new shipment coming in and make sure it's not the bottom of the pile that's been sitting there for months and months. Mm -hmm. uh, because yes. then it's pretty compressed and sometimes it's art, it's a little wet and it's actually starting to get kind of moldy and nasty. Yep. Carpentino Brothers is over in Kent. And when we I lived on the other side, we used to buy, they have a huge farm and stuff over there. And I used to buy flowers and stuff from them all the time. So they've got some great, great stuff. It so is really good. Yeah, yeah, they're local. I use some of I use some of that, which would be good. There. Another question I want to ask Ann is I've got some, you know, boxes. If I take this stuff out, can I, should I plant like a cover crop of something like over the winter and then, and then don't you just dig it in like for the nitrogen? Yeah, you can do that. Definitely. And, you know, one of the things to use like winter wheat is one I've often used or buckwheat. Uh -huh. uh, some of the like fava beans is, is really a, a typical one or um, some of the annual clovers will work like that. Uh, they're, and they're pretty good too. 
if you don't feel like the green manure thing, if it's, you know, you have to keep cutting it back. Like as it grows, every time it gets about 18 inches, you cut it back. And then in the spring, you cut it back all the way to the ground or pull them up. Um, if you don't feel like doing that, it's enough to cover them with leaves, like six or eight inches of leaves. Okay. And put a little mesh over it or something so they don't blow around. But that's actually a great rich mixture too. And you probably have leaves, I'm guessing. I have, we have a lot of leaves. Yes. Yeah. So I, I can just cover, cover them. Yeah. Okay. And then that's a good idea about putting some mesh or something over the top of it too. Yeah. Cause they blow around otherwise. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Sure. And speaking of, uh, you know, at, uh, supplementing our soil for um, winter crops, uh, you know, I live on a third floor deck and we have pots and, and planters. What would you recommend we grow? Well, if it was me, Karen King, I'd be growing yeah. kale. I'm growing six kinds of kale right now. And I like kale. We eat it every day. So mm -hmm. uh, I'd grow kale. I'd probably grow some leeks or, uh, you know, grow your own garlic. It's not very difficult. It's really fun to harvest your own garlic, right? Um, and, and there's the heart, the kinds you can plant. You'll find starts of it even in the winter because one of the traditional days in Italy for planting garlic is Christmas Day. Wow. Right? Yeah. Or winter solstice. Yes. Uh, and that's for the summer harvest. And if you want it, you know, but it's fun. I love that kind of stuff. I was growing red onions and I was so excited that my red onions are beautiful, right? <laughs> um, you could grow in the winter time, you could grow some Brussels sprouts if you wanted. But a lot of the winter greens in a smaller pots, I'd probably look for some of those winter hardy lettuces like the um, Marvel of Four Seasons is a good one. Or uh, there's one called Troutback. That's kind of a speckled German lettuce. Um, a lot of the bib types are winter hardy. If they get too cold, they can get some, they can bitter. So I just, if you got a piece of um, floating row cover, like Rime or something, you can just throw it over them at night and that'll keep them sweet, just like a tunnel. But yeah, those, those are actually, um, and you know, Cold air sinks, so you're on the third level. Right, right. You're going to have a little bit of frost protection that way, but it doesn't sink that far. <laughs> no. <laughs> but you can still harvest a lot of greens. Yeah. And spinach, you know, spinach is a great crop for... I'm just oh, okay. another crop of peas, because I figured I'm going to get an, another whack at the peas. Um, arugula is another good one, you know, for putting in now. And things like broccolini or broccoli rob that are pretty fast and mm -hmm. you, you know, you're going to eat those side shoots and you can sometimes pick those till March in a good year. Wow. So well, yeah, that's the kind of stuff. Yeah. What was, what was the name of the, um, the lettuce that you talked about? Um, well, the classic one is called um, Marvel of Four Seasons because it's a French four season lettuce. Um, trout back is another one, uh, but any of the bib type lettuces are going to be good. And some of the romaines, like the red romaine, like red rumple, that's pretty tough too. And that will, you know, if you, if you start them now or get starts of them now, they'll, um, they'll go on until you get a really hard frost. And again, where, where, where do, do we it? get the starts? Uh, most of the nurseries have those fall plant starts. And okay. you know, yeah, they should, this is the time. They should be pretty well stocked actually. And anything they have as a fall start will probably grow for you. But if you don't have a ton of space, you're not going to be looking to grow anything gigantic, right? Um, yeah, lots of greens. Those are my okay. favorites anyway. And I always like to grow hardy herbs because you can walk out the door and pick and just add a little bit. And things like rosemary and sage, thyme uh, are going to be available to you all winter long. They're all evergreen, which is, you know, perfect, right? Yes. That yeah. sounds like a really good song there that you just Doesn't talked it? <laughs> Aaron, maybe we should do a herb, herb karaoke. <laughs> That's our herb karaoke. There you go. There you go. Oibel ones. Oibel. If you're from Joyce, it would be Oibel. Yeah, Oibel. Well, thank you. That's perfect. So, yeah. yeah, we'll head to the nursery. Yeah, and that's the other thing to think about. Like, if you've been, you know, feeling like your garden isn't really as exciting or beautiful as you wish it was, the really good times to go shopping is when 
in the off season because a plant mm -hmm. that looks good in the nursery in October, November, December, January, that's a good plant. And that will make sure if you start, you know, everybody plants for spring because it's like we're all ready and you go out and buy all this cool stuff, but that can leave the garden looking pretty blank. Now there's all these gorgeous hellebores, there's beautiful ferns, there's burgenias, there's a ton of things that will look really beautiful in the winter time, including those winter blooming camellias I was talking about earlier, the sasanquin, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and they're small. Um, you could actually have a sasanquin, a big pot for years. I had a huge mm -hmm. pot, like a big pot, <laughs> but that tree was about six feet high on my deck and it looked gorgeous. And it was called Yuletide with red flowers with golden centers and it bloomed at Christmas. Ooh, so sounds wonderful. Yeah. So, you know, don't be, don't be shy to plant stuff. Okay. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, our nurseries can really use our help. Like, it's kind of been amazing. People are out buying vegetables, but the ornamentals and things haven't been um, as strong. And I think it's a great time to look because all the plants go on sale in the fall. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm always looking for a bargain out there. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. You could grow a, a gardenia on your deck, Karen. Well, we, oh, gardenia, yeah. Yeah, there's one called Frost Proof. That's a double Ooh. blossom that's really beautiful and so fragrant. Oh, I love gardenias. Yeah, if you're just gonna have one, that's a good one to have. Because we used, we had them in California and the fragrance was just, oh. Yeah. Almost so wonderful. It is. Yes, I love gardenias. So, yeah. Well, we'll think about that. There you go. And there's a, a camellia that used to bloom downtown um, that had the most gorgeous scent. Do you know what kind that is? Yeah, some of them are fragrant. There's is not one kind, but there's quite a few kinds. And the labels, the tags at the nursery should all say if it's fragrant or not. Some don't have any scent at all. Yeah. Um, it, the the lighter colored ones tend to be more fragrant, but some of the light pinks are. Um, and it's sort of all over the place because that wasn't a gene that really got bred for particularly mm -hmm. uh, in this country. And a lot of the, the hybridizing that went on with camellias that were hardy in America happened in Washington, D.C. At the, at the National Arboretum. And they were all named for the secretaries. <laughs> so that's why we have... Patty Jean and Suzanne <laughs> and Betty Sue. Those are all <laughs> Washington DC ones, but you know, we can grow things that they can't. So we um, have a little broader range and we don't have to stick with those. So yeah, if you ask at the nursery, they can help you find a nice fragrant one. Cool, and I didn't know if it was terribly rare or, you know, yeah. No, but it's like, I mean, there's even a couple of hydrangeas that are fragrant, but not very many and, and it's unusual. Um, because again, they're not bred for that. And some of the species that have that fragrance are not particularly hardy. So it has to be a cross that will carry the fragrance gene and also be able to be, um, take our Northwest climate. Yeah. And and the, the frost-free gardenia you were talking about, can you just grow that in your garden or should it be in a pot and protect it? Or what's the... Yeah, you know? it's, it's winter hardy. They like um, afternoon shade and morning okay. sun. And they like pretty well-drained, rich soil, which rules out most of us. <laughs> so uh -huh. mine is in a big, big pot, and it's pretty yeah. happy in a big, big pot. But it really does need, it's sort of weird. It needs even moisture when it's getting ready to bloom and during its bloom period, but it can't have, it doesn't like heavy clay. So it's that, you know, yeah. act of keeping it moist enough at the right time and letting it drain really well the rest of the year. And it will bloom, what, in the winter or the spring or what? The gardenia? Yeah. Well, they bloom, like mine's blooming now. It's been blooming since probably late May. Whoa. Yeah. And they bloom pretty much all summer. Um, indoors, if you had a little greenhouse or a garden room, you can get, they'll sort of bloom off and on all year round. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. The Most of those frost proof ones, like um, Clem's Hardy is... To my mind, it isn't the prettiest. It's pretty tardy, but frostproof is a much prettier plant. And it gets like three to four feet. So it's not impossible to have that in a, in a greenhouse situation or a sun porch. Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, I'm going to go get me one. <laughs> <Here you go. laughs> 
<laughs> I think Bainbridge Gardens just got theirs last week, I think. Ah, cool. Yeah. I make it a habit to go cruise the nurseries pretty often. You know, when the days are tough sometimes and all the news is crap, then I'll go to the nursery or I'll go look at my bees <laughs> buzzing around in my garden and just walk around and look at all the plants and have a, it's a very nice little meditation, right? It's easy to socially distance in a nursery. Yeah. That's what we found. There's, you know, we try to find a time where there's not, it's usually Brian that likes to shop with me at the nursery. And we go at a time where there's not, there's very few cars in the parking lot and we walk around and it's, it is, I, it's, it's wonderful. It feels so good. It does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's fun to, you know, bring home a little treasure. and Absolutely. Nurture those little plants. And you know, keep our businesses going. I mean, exactly. Yeah, we've got to keep our local businesses going too. Right. Which includes our nurseries. Yes. This absolutely. is my two year anniversary in September of not buying anything from Amazon. I'm very proud of myself. And I buy as little online as possible, actually. And sometimes I cheat and make my kid do it. But um, <laughs> he's already buying stuff. But, but I'm pure, right? I'm very pure. <laughs> And they're really trying hard to buy whatever we can buy locally because the stores are really struggling and they're trying hard. Like our little craft shop is so sweet downtown, right where the teriyaki place is. And I take my grandkids down there. We go every week and find something that they mm -hmm. can make or do. It's just sweet, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, once a week or so, it's good to have takeout and go down there and let somebody else feed us. Um, but yeah, it's amazing what we can find locally too when we're when we're looking. Mm -hmm. And guess what? There's so much parking. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It is true. <laughs> not on the weekends though. It's bizarre. People are still coming over by the boatload. I just yeah. not quite sure why. But um, but yeah. Yeah, we avoid town on the weekends. So well, we can walk down, but it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Luckily, most people still wear masks, but every once in a while, there'll be a few people. That, nope. <laughs> Pretty good. I've seen mm -hmm. most people are. And my daughter got me this awesome bucket hat with a Velcro, and it's got a curved uh, oh. heel thing, right? Yeah, heel. Yeah. It's look a little serious when you put it on, but it's great for gardening. <laughs> <laughs> I can see what I'm doing, and I don't get sticks in my eye. And I'm not getting covered with pollen. And it, actually, I really like it for gardening. It's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I was wearing it at the library and I got some slightly, well, let's just put it that I got a little ribbing for mm. looking silly. But, um, but hey, I think it's a good idea. I That's bet right. you don't keep your bees away from your face too. <laughs> right? You know, they're so gentle when they, I can be in there weeding or watering and they don't they just move over i move over they move over it's like they're busy they don't have time to it's the hornets and the yellow jackets that are getting irritable about this time of year because they're yeah. getting ready to go dormant or die and it makes it makes you a little short-tempered <laughs> yeah my my yellow i think they're yellow jackets i think so are feeding off my hummingbird feeder like yeah. crazy crazy yeah. And the and the, the the hummingbirds come and they they don't put up they you know they'll they'll fly away because they don't want to have anything to do with those bees. And the bees will fly come in as the hummingbirds are eating or drinking and the um the they'll they'll buzz. They'll literally buzz those poor birds and then the birds then fly away and the and the bees stay. Ah everybody's trying to live, right? Yeah, for sure. I know I've been kind of thinking a lot lately about how our ver ideas about the balance of nature are really twisted by children's books. <laughs> kind of unrealistic sometimes. <laughs> well, I found a new um, obsession. Oh, tell. Collecting pine cones. Okay. And the reason for that is that I have always gotten free chips for my garden paths in previous years, somebody was always, you know, eating up a tree or something. And I didn't this year. So I was wondering if I could use pine cones. And they work beautifully. 
in fact, better than garden chips for keeping weeds away. So, you know, under any fur, you can take, I get boxes and, and you can sit right down on the ground and do it, which is very yummy or something. And then once you walk on them, um, they smush up and uh, they're very attractive. They're the same color as mulch. And maybe it's just me, but I love to collect them. <laughs> no, that's, that's a great idea. And right, talk about a natural resource that's extremely renewable. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's a really good idea. I used to mulch my paths with coffee beans that I got from the Good, uh, the Good Coffee Company in Seattle. Every now and then, Joe Cote would over roast a batch by mistake or decide a batch wasn't good. And he oh. gave me one time 500 pounds of coffee, five oh big God. bags. And I made the paths with it and they smelled incredible. And oh. so many plants seeded into it that a lot of these rare primroses and things that I had a hard time seeding, seeded right into it. And I noticed it had this little white, um, it looked like a mold, but apparently it's a beneficial mold. And I sent some to WSU and they said, yeah, it's a, um, there are actually molds that promote plant growth, not just so oh. molds and mushrooms are not all bad at all. Fungus can really be helpful. Did but I love that. That's your slug? Hmm? Did it seem to limit your slugs having all those? Yes. And, well, and cause here's the thing that caffeine actually dehydrates slugs. So if you mulch with coffee grounds, yeah, um, and things like lettuces and stuff. When the slugs crawl across them, it will actually dry them out. Not immediately, but it dries them up. Well, so really that's quickly. how it works. So it doesn't really keep them off. It just eventually kills them. Yeah, it dries them up. And then you can make earrings out of them. Spray paint them gold. Make little cool. Christmas ornaments. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, jewelry, how it's very <laughs> Northwesty. Yes. <laughs> Two slugs dangling from your ears, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so how, how long do we have to put up with these slugs? Boy, this has been a crazy slug year. Just oh, yeah. nuts. And, you know, most of what I see in the garden are not native slugs. They're mostly the European slugs. And they're coming, you know, they're in the soil now. They're established here. But they just keep hatching out new batches. So there's always these little young ones. And they're the tough ones. I think last month we talked about how the little babies don't eat slug bait. So that's when I'd put beer traps out um, in a jar or a cup that's sunk partway into the ground at a tilt. So the beer collects at the bottom and the slug will go in there to drink and um, drown in happiness. I mean, it's not a terrible way to go, right? It's less painful to them than salting or spraying them with ammonia or anything like that. So I figure, you know, beer traps are kind of just helping somebody out. It's kind of like assisted, what do you call that? Death with dignity, right? I use beer traps a lot. Yeah. And they're, so it's amazing how many slugs get in that. Yeah, it's crazy. And I've discovered, I had I read this article quite a long time. Actually, it was a study done of the different kinds of beer, and they discovered that the most popular beer with slugs was St. Polly Girl Dark, which is a really cheap, cheap beer. So, <laughs> so you know, you get a six-pack, and it probably lasts you a year, because you only you need a little, right? But yeah, what I do is use those um, paper cups or something and put it in the ground, and when it gets full of slugs, I just throw it away and start again. Because I'm not fishing slugs out of a trap. Sorry. It's so helpful, Anne. Just listening to this is, and it's an upper. So thanks so much. You're so welcome. It's really fun. And you know, first Tuesday came really fast this month. I was sort it of, did. Yeah, yeah, I almost missed it myself. It was like, oh, whoops, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess we'll just keep going because, you know, there's around here, there's stuff to talk about most of the year. So as long as you show up, we'll still have these talks. <laughs>